uh, splendid and very instructive and fun fun lecture. I think we'll we'll all uh, look at art uh, uh, and at the world in different ways after listening to you. No, uh, um, the only bad thing I have to say about about your lecture is that it's so good that you lose readers for your uh, for your book, because now we don't have to uh, we don't have to read uh, we don't have to read uh, vision and and art. We just have to listen to you um, to you talking. Um, no, I'm not going to challenge you, but I'm going to, in the spirit of the uh, you know the purpose of the morning of the morning session, kind of prompt you, encourage you to go beyond go beyond your lecture. So uh, th th there is no real challenging challenging to do. Um, and, and to do that, I'm just going to say that the first thing that you know, I noticed when I listened to you, but I also noticed or positively noticed when reading your, uh, your work on art and the neurobiology of vision is that contrary to a certain number of other scholars who are associated with neuroesthetics, you've stayed away from grand claims about art and visual aesthetics, as well as from sort of more or less derogatory comments on what many people in neuroesthetics consider as the you know, traditional, that is to say, in their view, you know, speculative and unscientific questions of aesthetics. And you've, you've made that very clear, and you've wisely restrained, uh, refrained from embarking in such you know, self-defeating adventures as trying to provide a neurobiological definition of beauty of which there's at least one, and I would like to quote it. Beauty is some quality in bodies that correlates with activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex by the intervention of the senses. Um, we can discuss this because I would like to know what you think about these kinds of things. Um, but I think such definitions and the projects that produce them are, I personally think that are a dead end, and I'm you know, making this opinion stark so that uh, as to prompt, to prompt conversation. But Margaret Livingston, I don't think, is on that blind alley. And that's why I've often given your work as an example. Uh, Margaret is, has been very clear that her interest concerns how some art reveals some important things about the basic mechanisms of vision. And I believe her work demonstrates how neurobiological knowledge, like other sorts of knowledge concerning many other things from, say, pigments and techniques to styles and symbols, enhances our appreciation of art. So I think that this kind of information enhances our appreciation of art, enhances it in a different way than other kinds of, uh, kinds of information. Um, so though my comments will sound skeptical, uh, the target of my skepticism is not what you've just been talking about, really, but the ambitions of neuroesthetics as uh, neuroesthetics as it has been practiced so far and for the most part. So I'm not. I want to suggest that there may be other ways, other other avenues of exploration of neuroesthetics and art. As a visual scientist. Uh, Margaret Livingstone does not seem to share those ambitions and knows perfectly well that stereo blindness is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for someone to become an artist, let alone a great artist. But I still want to make my skeptical comments for two reasons. One is that some of your contributions or you know, remarks may be interpreted. Yes, please, go ahead. You, you, you have paid your own paper? Just take the whole thing. Um, uh, I, I have here what I want to say. Um, so the reason why I still want to make my, my skeptical comments is, as I said, for two reasons. And one is that some of your contributions and remarks might be interpreted as going in the same direction as neuroesthetics. Uh, as neuroesthetics. Uh, um, and the other, which is my real motivation in the context of this meeting and the, you know, the morning session, is that I would like to prompt you to go beyond what you've told us and to draw some consequences of your work, if you think there might be, for thinking about what the relationships are between neurosciences, the neurobiology of vision, uh, and understanding aesthetic experience and understanding art. Um, a little bit more in the perspective that uh, Jean-Marie Schaeffer brought this morning. You know, what, what about aesthetic experience? Um, my first commentary, my first comment basically concerns the assertion that art 
teaches something about the brain. It has been very clear that you know, you're not, you, you, you know, your interest is not, you know, what was neuroscience telling us about art, but what is art telling us, telling us about the brain? And so, so my comment concerns that, that art teaches us something about the brain. Now, we have indeed learned a lot about the brain mechanisms of vision and visual perception as they are variously involved in the production and reception of artworks. But my question is, what exactly is doing the teaching? Is it really art as such? The efficacy of caricature, Mona Lisa's smile, or the sun's effect in Monet's Impression Soleil Levant propose perceptual riddles. And as you've shown, you know, neurobiology and the neuropsychology of perception provide solutions to those riddles and account for the puzzling effects of those works of art. The problem is that many other objects in the world that do not qualify as work of, uh, works of art propose exactly the same riddles. So what we learn is that artworks share perceptual properties with the rest of the things we perceive in the world and that art, artworks are perceived by way of the same mechanisms as anything else. I personally think this is an important insight, uh, also for art historical reasons, I think this is an important insight, and one that, at least to me, procures considerable intellectual and aesthetic satisfaction, you know, both in general and when I'm confronted with particular works of art, and, and now I know something about the mechanisms, of some of the mechanisms that make me see those works of art the way I see them. So for me, it enhances the aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic experience, and is part of that very complex process that Jean-Marie Schaeffer uh, described this morning when his sort of plea for, uh, in his plea for um, aesthetic experience. At the same time that this happens, I'm not sure about the significance of all that information for understanding art as the specific phenomenon we call art, rather than for understanding art as a collection of visual stimuli equivalent to other collections of visual stimuli. No, this is, this is what Chiara uh, uh, this morning in her commentary on Jean-Marie uh, Schaeffer, you know, described as artworks versus patchworks. You know, so is the neurobiology of vision, is the, are the neurosciences illuminating uh, us about patchworks or about artworks? And I think this is a very, very important, both methodological and conceptual question, and I know this is not, you know, your, your topic, but I would like to prompt you to, you know, to sort of uh, tell us something about that from the point of view of your extraordinary competencies uh, in, uh, in vision sciences. In a review of Steven Pinker's uh, The Blank Slate, uh, uh, Margaret's colleague, Louis Menin, who is a professor of English and American literature and language at Harvard, observed that, I quote, every aspect of life has a biological foundation in exactly the same sense, which is that unless it was biologically possible, it wouldn't exist. And after that, Menan said, after that, it's up for grabs. The fact that this remark is very obvious doesn't make it any less accurate or relevant. I guess the point I want to bring by, making, by doing this quotation is that there are no intrinsically art objects or more broadly inherently aesthetic things. Things become aesthetic by virtue of intentions, functions, context, and because humans entertain with them what Gérard Genette called the aesthetic relation, la relation esthétique. And as Genette uh, put it, it is not the object that makes the relation aesthetic, it is the relation that makes the object aesthetic. Ce n'est pas l'objet qui rend la relation esthétique, mais la relation qui rend l'objet esthétique. Um, now, if this is so, then, uh, to put it a little bit bluntly, then um, the aesthetic relation begins where neuroesthetics ends. Uh, Jeanette's statement, and perhaps I think quite a bit of what Jean-Marie Schaeffer told us this morning, may also suggest that art as such doesn't teach us anything about the brain, even though the neurosciences can tell us a lot about the perceptual mechanisms involved in artworks considered as visual stimuli equivalent to other stimuli that do not qualify as art, considered as patchworks rather than as artworks. Now, from the standpoint of aesthetics and art history, what we have here is a very well-known problem. It's the well-known problem that Arthur Danto 
cryptically but accurately characterized as the problem of the indiscernible counterparts that may have radically distinct ontological affiliations. He gave, it a, gave this a, more, a simpler formulation. He put it this way. Why is Andy Warhol's Brillo box art when the Brillo, box, the Brillo cartons in the warehouse are merely soap pad containers? Now, from the standpoint of neuroaesthetics, what we have here, what this, what this brings up, is the problem of relevance which Oxford philosopher John Hyman summarized somewhat brashly when he wrote that neuroesthetics, I call him, quote him, tells us nothing about Picasso and Cezanne that doesn't apply equally to Hagen Dazs and McDonald's, because neuroesthetics is so focused on the problem of hedonic judgment and saying, I find this ugly, I find this beautiful, I like this, I don't like this. And it's very difficult to go beyond that when you're sitting inside a scanner. Um, so these are some, these are some of, the, of the issues uh, involved in investigating uh, and thinking about the relationship between neuroscience and art. And as I said, what I'd like to do is simply to encourage you to, to tell us now about what, what, you think, what you think about them. So in other, in other words, I'm, I'm asking you sort of for your thoughts on the significance of the neurobiology of art and perhaps also on the projects that are usually associated with the term uh, neuroesthetics. And my second comment is very closely connected to this, to this first one. In addition to the axiom that art is a product of the brain, which is it, can itself be understood in many different ways, some of them obvious and some of them questionable, neuroesthetics is driven by the conviction that artists can be considered as instinctive or practical neuroscientists. And I think that this is, this is, this is some of what some of you, you communicate when you say, okay, so the artist knew this, you know, the artist used, uh, used, these, used these processes. Um, artists are said to have discovered fundamental truths that professional brain scientists, like you yourself, unravel in their laboratories. So for example, Margaret, you've shown us today that artists discovered the separate processing of color and luminance. We know that Monet knew about the separate processing of color and luminance because we see this knowledge embodied in Impression Soleil Levant. Now, on the one hand, however, this seems rather different from what happened in the history of physics, for example, where artisan traditions in practical ballistics or shipbuilding were transformed and assimilated into systematic knowledge in mechanics and dynamics. On the other hand, when we say that we know that Monet knew, uh, the same verb, to know, refers to different epistemic and psychological realities. And the question is, do these differences boil down to, say, you know, intuition versus knowledge? Or is the idea of the artist as intuitive neuroscientist simply misguided or a kind of, you know, Land metaphor. In short, what is the epistemic status of the unconscious neuroscientific knowledge that is attributed to the artist? Have artists in any direct manner contributed to science in the same way that artisans did in the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance? Yes, they did, of course, when they placed themselves in the position of, say, an anatomist or a theorit theoretician of perspective. But I'm talking about their contribution when they were operating as artists. And have far, so what is the ultimate purpose of considering artists and neuroscientists? And how far can one go in that direction? In an article published in Nature in 2005, a psychologist of the vision sciences laboratory, also at Harvard, and I think you've shown us some of your work, claimed that impressionism is so effective because the amygdala, a center of, emotion in the, of emotions in the brain, responds more strongly, most strongly, to a blurry version of faces expressing fear. In other words, Impressionist paintings work because, I quote him, may, because I quote him, they, Impressionist paintings, may connect more directly to emotional centers than to conscious image recognition area. Now, in my view, claims of that sort materialize the worst that can happen to the juncture, at the juncture of neuroscience and aesthetics. But they also instantiate an inclination that seems always latent in neuroesthetics. And that's why, Margaret, I'd like to ask you to share thoughts with us, your thoughts not necessarily on that article, which you surely know, but on the beliefs encapsulated in its title, which was precisely the artist as neuroscientist. 
start at the beginning. So I do try to stay away from neuroaesthetics. If we think about what do we mean by aesthetics, which we've talked about already today, we get down to the hedonic scale. And when neuroscientists deal with reward, which is all we can measure, and responses to reward of humans or animals, we're just at the beginning of understanding why animals, on a, in, at a neurological level, how reward and reinforcement work. So I think we are so far from understanding in the hierarchy, reward, reinforcement, pleasure, beauty, aesthetics, we're way, we're, we're way down at the beginning on that. I, I don't think, for the most part, we have any business talking about aesthetics. When I talk to artists, which I love to do, I learn a lot from them. But we're always talking at the level of techniques, tools, things that artists use and things that artists have invented that resonate with me as a practitioner of neuroscience. And the only thing that I hope my work can ever do that contributes in the other direction instead of just taking from the world of art and art history is that sometimes I can come up with linking features because artists have figured out these, the shimmery quality and creating a sense, an odd sense of depth. If I can tell them what all the functions are of this part of our visual system, they can link things like motion and depth that they would otherwise not tie together. And they're, they're often quite pleased to know why one thing works in one context also works in another context, that they have something in common. Is it art? Oh, yes, it's not um, art that teaches me. It's what the artists do and the techniques that they develop, which are often profound. I, I would prefer not to use the word instinctive. I'd, I'd rather use the word empirical because I think it's more deliberate. It, it, it's an experiment that artists do, and they communicate with each other. I mean, all the impressionists hung out together. They painted together. They talked about what they were accomplishing. And, and of course, everything that I talk about applies to everyday objects, and to, it especially applies to marketing. I think advertisers have, you wouldn't call them artists, and yet they are creating things that have effects, and they love being able to create effects that, that they couldn't create before that are surprising or attention-getting. And computer graphics people, too. I go to a lot of computer graphics meetings. All right, so I did my first page. Let's see. Yeah, after that, it's up for grabs. The part about making it aesthetic, I, I feel that it, it, in when I talk to artists and work with artists, that bit about aesthetics, that's in their ball field, not mine. It's theirs. I, they take the techniques, and they create beauty from it. I just say, oh, that's interesting what you're doing. Yes, and I agree that aesthetics begins where neuroaesthetic. I, I like the Brillo box thing. I mean, he put it in the wrong place. That's what he did. Um, and and the, the urinal, too. I mean, that's all putting, putting something in the wrong place. I think artists are empirically figuring out that you use your brain differently in different contexts. If I may just may sure. I say, may I say something now, just to that, to that point. For me, it was illuminating what you, know, what you said about location and so on, because, of course, we would tend to look at the efficacy of the Brillo boxes or Duchamp's urinal and so on purely in cultural terms, which is, I think, also the way in which they themselves saw it, uh, the public at the time at the time saw it. But uh, you've added you've added this dimension. You know, they are parallel, they are homologous. Do they have a relationship? I don't know, but it does add something. Chiara, okay. Oh, she wants us to be quiet. No, just go ahead. Yeah. Do artists contribute to science? Yes, they really do. But they, the usual route is that 
artists figure stuff out, and then um, the psychophysicists, the vision psychologists get hold of it. And then once the vision psychologists get hold of it, quantify it, and show all kinds of parameterization of it and everything, then the neurophysiologists get hold of it. And so there's this, this filter of, of stuff coming in from the art world in, through psychology to neurobiology. Yes, they do, absolutely, no question about it. I don't know about the amygdala. Okay, I think we can open, we can open up the discussion, Jean-Marie. Uh, 